tell us a little bit about Canadian MDR. And I may or may not lose reception and or choose to hit breakfast because it's free and <laughs> they're gonna close before this webinar is over. Okay. I mean parties, right? Yeah, you gotta eat. You can't submit anything if you're malnourished. Am I right? That's right. Take it away. Okay. Uh, do I have permission to share my screen too? And you do whatever you want. Okay. So I only have a few slides here and I'm really looking for feedback from people because next week I'm gonna be doing a full-blown webinar on how to prepare through, um, prepare your quality system for the, the regulations. But um, I didn't wanna bore everybody on the phone with all the minute details that are designed for a training for in-house compliance with the MDR. It's more high level with, this is what you need to be doing. And if you haven't already done it and you're already in Canada, um, boy, do you have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so like Joe said, I think he characterized it well, the lesser known MDR. It's, it's just MDR because it's medical device regulation. In Canada, it's medical devices regulation, but it's still the MDR. And so you have the European MDR and you have the Canadian MDR. But they made changes to it a year ago, December 23rd, 2020. They made changes and there was no fanfare or anything because COVID was sort of overshadowing everything else. So we have this big change in the Canadian regulations requiring post-market surveillance and nobody even noticed. So we have procedures for everybody that are out of date. Um, and I can't say that we're perfect because part of the reason I'm doing this is because we have clients who are like, we still don't have that update for the MDR for Canada. I'm like, oh yeah. So I knew about it. I just didn't put the time into it. So now I'm scrambling to get it done before December 23rd. And so I actually scheduled my webinar for December 23rd. And we have the, the new procedure going out uh, next week. And so everybody will have the procedure and training next week, just barely in time. But the work should have been something you already were working on long ago. So very short agenda here. Number one, what is the new regulation? So it actually has a regulation number. Uh, the original MDR is SOR 98282, I think. And this new one that was released, and I think the, the law behind it is called Vanessa's Law, um, but it's SOR 2020-262. And the draft was back in 2019. So people have known about this for a really long time if they were following Canada. If they weren't following Canada, they're, they're learning the hard way now, like, oh, I should have been working on this for the last two years. So what changed that whenever you have a new regulation in Canada um, or changes to the Canadian MDR, you go to SOR 98-282 and you have to compare the changes with the previous version that you wrote your quality system for. So if you're like one of our clients, they haven't done any updates since March, 2018. And here's um, the latest version, November 18th, 2021. So we're talking over three years since the last time they made an update to their Canadian procedures. And they said, well, there aren't that many changes, are there? Well, the bad news is we have 1,451 changes. So we have replacements, insertions, deletions. And if you have never seen this table before, this output of results comparing documents, this is Adobe's version of what we can do with Microsoft Word. We can do merged uh, two documents and compare the changes, old version versus new version. This is Adobe's version, the exact same thing. I don't think it's as user-friendly, but it spits out this great report telling you how many changes there are, which is kind of nice um, for a presentation, but you actually have to go through every single one still and figure out, okay, is this something that is something I have to change or did they just reformat that section of words? So a lot of these are reformattings. They say insertions, but they just move things around and that's called an insertion. So 
uh, the actual number of changes probably fits on two pages, but there are some big ones here. So you really have to make some changes to your procedures um, and not just the title on the top. There, there's definitely some changes and any MD SAP auditor will know what to look for. So if, if, if people are not familiar with Canadian regulations, um, there is now a requirement for MD SAP certification in Canada. It's been around for many years now. Um, I think at least five years. And the MDSAP program, it's an acronym for Medical Device Single Audit Program. And the goal was to have one audit that covers all the countries in the world. Only certain countries have actually opted in. So US is one of them. So if you get MDSAP certification, you reduce the likelihood of FDA inspections. Canada requires it by law, so you don't have an option for Canada. Brazil is another one that opted in. Australia is one that opted in and Japan opted in, but Canada is the only one that absolutely requires it. You cannot even apply for a license to distribute product in Canada without this. So if you've got Canadian license, you've got 1,451 changes to figure out what have I got to do? And this is how I do it. So I'm showing you behind the scenes how Rob actually does this. I actually took um, my really big uh, plasma screen that's 48 inches and I projected on it the side by side of the old version versus the new version. So old versions on the left, new versions on the right. And it actually shows you what, what Adobe does to it to highlight what the changes are. And then I have a little tiny pixel book in front of me and I type notes that are eventually going to be my presentation and my blog and, and information about these changes for guidance for people that want to read instead of watching a webinar. But I, I usually start with the writing first and then I do the presentation. And then we have one-on-ones with companies that have detailed Q&A that they wanna do. But you can see here, it, I don't know if you, how well you can read it, but the stuff that's in red on the left has been changed to what's the stuff on the right in blue and the words haven't changed. It's just been reformatting and moving it on the page. So even though they've highlighted it as something that's different, it's not actually different. It's just reformatted. The next thing that the FDA did, I'm sorry, that Canada did is they actually created guidance documents for this. So these have been out for quite a while. Um, probably almost a year now, they actually created four different guidance documents for companies to explain how um, these new regulations will come into effect and what you need to do as a company to be compliant. So the first item is incident reporting. It's no longer called mandatory problem reporting. So that was one of the things that companies need to do. They need to change all their uh, vigilance procedures for Canada instead of saying vigilance or MDR reporting for the US, it's called or was called mandatory problem reporting or MPRs. Now it's called incident reporting. And this has been for a year now. So people that haven't updated those procedures, that's one of the things they have to update. And it's not just the title. There are actually changes in there uh, to the wording in different sections and auditors might be looking for those. The second guidance document is foreign risk notification for medical devices. So this is if you have products in other countries, you used to not have to report them to Health Canada unless you were um, implementing corrective action. So you might have a recall. They want to be notified if you're going to have a recall. But this foreign risk notification, now they're, they're making it a little bit more elaborate as to what things trigger you have to report uh, to them. A, a change or some sort of problem with your device. So that's another aspect that you already have to have complied with because um, of the new law, half of it went into effect uh, in June and the other half of it goes into effect December 23rd. So you should already have updated your procedure to say incident reporting. You should have already updated your procedure to say that you have to notify Health Canada of changes that occur in other countries. The third aspect is pushed off until December 23rd, so next week. That relates to summary reports. Now, this really fundamentally isn't any different 
from what you should already be doing for Europe. So if you're in Europe and you're CE marked and you're doing um, manage, I'm sorry, um, you're doing post-market surveillance reports and post-market surveillance plans, and you're doing it for a product or a product family, and you're gathering all that information together, and then updating your risk management file accordingly and updating your labeling, and maybe even making changes to the device to keep it to the state of the art. That's what Health Canada wants you to do too. So they're requiring before it, they had the right to request um, information on post-market surveillance. Now it's not, they have the right to request, you shall create summary reports. And not only do you have to create the summary reports, they're going a little bit further and they're saying, we want you to provide a benefit risk analysis with conclusions that's updated. And that's something the Europeans have required is you have to have a benefit risk analysis for all products. Here's Health Canada saying you have to have a benefit risk analysis for all products. And they not only want you to update this benefit risk analysis based on your post-market surveillance, but they also want you to notify them if there are any changes to your conclusions. So if if any of those benefit risks change, those, some of the benefits disappear or some of the risks increase, they want you to now uh, notify them of those changes. And you might even have to reapply with for a license change or amendment to your license. And so th this is quite different from the US. In the US, for those of you that are only familiar with the US system, the FDA doesn't require post-market surveillance. They don't even have a post-market section in the QSR. So 21 CFR 820, no requirement for post-market surveillance. ISO 1345 requires post-market surveillance, but you're not required to be ISO 1345 certified to be in the US. You're required to be ISO certified um, for Health Canada and most European companies or CE marketing companies, they have it as well. And the European MDR requires post-market surveillance and they require benefit risk analysis. So that's a fundamental difference between US, Europe, and Canada. Europe and Canada now are aligned. They're requiring post-market surveillance and the benefit risk analysis for all the products and the FDA is not. So the, the FDA is really falling behind in that respect. Um, and then the last one was a guidance document um, on new authorities and their amendments, including the power to require assessments and the power to require tests and studies. So if Health Canada is not happy with what they see in these post-market studies, they can actually force you to do testing and do um, either post-market surveillance studies or clinical studies or some other type of audit. So they could actually require an MD SAP audit of your company for special cause. And that they've given themselves that new power uh, to force that on companies. So those are some of the new guidance. These are the four new guidance documents that they put in with this new regulation, uh, SOR 2020-262. So if that doesn't sound like a lot more work, <laughs> uh, it, then you're, you must be up to date with the European stuff and like, oh, that's stuff we already do. We're in great shape. But if you're not CE marked and you're one of those companies that has FDA in Canada or just Canada, you suddenly have a lot more work that you had to prepare for in the last two years. And they've even split it up uh, very similar to Europe. The expectation is for high risk devices, you have to do these annually. Um, for the low risk devices, like a, a class one product, you would only have to do this every other year. So biannually. Um, so depending on what your risk classification is, um, for your product, you will have different timelines for how frequently you have to generate these reports. And if you're one of those companies that is a class one only, and you're working with distributors that have a license and you don't have a license, they have to pr produce these reports. Um, so that's how the Health Canada's uh, handling it when you don't even have a license, you're piggybacking on a distributor's license because you have a really low risk product like a face mask. Um, not that anybody would be knowing anything about surgical masks nowadays. So the next step is action items. What are you going to do now that we know we have these new regulations? 
We know we have to read these four new guidance documents, but what you, should you do next? If you already are CE marked and you're already up to date on these Canadian regulations, you're great. You could probably do a, an internal audit to make sure that you're compliant, you didn't miss anything. You could have management reviews to make sure everything's on time regarding your post-market surveillance summary reports that have to be available as of December 23rd. But if you um, haven't done that and you need to get up to speed overnight, uh, or at least by next week, you might um, try taking a webinar that we're gonna be offering next week. And we cut the price in half uh, to make it affordable every to everybody. So Merry Christmas. Um, and it's uh, only for a short period of time, but it'll be recorded. And then after that, it'll go up the full price, but it's, I think it's 64 bucks. So for $64 and I think 50 cents, you can get a webinar that you can train all your people on uh, that are involved in post-market surveillance on how to comply with the post-market surveillance summary reporting requirements for Canada. And that might also help you with your European summary reporting requirements because they're very similar. The second thing you could do is if you don't have a post-market surveillance procedure, you could buy ours um, and you'll be able to identify changes between the old version and the new version. Uh, but if you would prefer to do it yourself, we're going to be giving you enough information in the training next uh, week that you'll be able to get the information you need to make revisions to your procedure. Or you could follow exactly what I did. You can do the compare and merge with the Adobe, and then you can go through the changes and you can read those guidance documents and you can update your own procedures. So that's another option. Um, whenever you're making change to a quality system, um, you're typically expected to have a quality plan. So um, the FDA is very vague on what a quality plan will be. And some people say, well, that's my uh, quality manual. That's my quality plan. That's not really what they meant when they wrote ISO 1345. What they meant is a step-by-step -step with milestones and who is responsible, what changes are you gonna make to the quality system and how are you gonna control those changes? So things like who's gonna revise the procedure, who's going to review the procedure, when are we going to do an internal audit to make sure that the procedure, the new procedure is effective, who's going to train the people, when do they need training by, that's the stuff that belongs in a quality plan. And it should be every time you make a significant change to your quality system. And if you have a notified body or certification, you need to notify them that we're making a significant change. The logical time to do that would be when you write your plan, so you can send them a plan this is what we're going to be doing. This is the timeline we're going to be doing it. We're notifying you now as we get started on it. And so before the system is completely changed, they've been notified and they have an opportunity to say, oh, we're going to have to do an audit of you or say, oh, no, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll catch you next standard surveillance audit. That's just a minor change, no big deal. And then the last thing is you should have an updated post-market surveillance plan because Probably like a lot of companies, if you are C marked, you've written it to make the Europeans happy, and you might want to modify that post-market surveillance plan a little bit to make the Canadians happy, so it covers both aspects. So some tweaking of your post-market surveillance plan might be a really good idea, and if you don't have one yet, you're going to need it. Um, the two things I didn't put on this list that should be for any change you might want to consider doing an internal audit after you've made the changes. That's number one. And number two, you might want to have a manager review, reviewing the results of the internal audit, saying, oh, these are things we didn't do well. Maybe next time when we do a quality plan, we should do that. And what do we need to do to fix these remaining items before we're 100% compliant before the, our MDCAP auditor comes back? And if you didn't do any of these things, and you would prefer to get a major nonconformity or even have your certificate suspended and your license suspended, that's an option. Uh, that's what's gonna happen to a lot of companies because they aren't even aware that the Canadians changed the regs. It's gonna happen December 23rd. The MD staff auditors are gonna come in, say you didn't address any of these changes. Here's your major nonconformity. And because this is the second time you've done this because you missed all the changes to the MDR uh, for Europe, um, this is a repeat nonconformity and we're gonna suspend your certificate. And uh, I actually have multiple clients that have done that. <laughs> so make sure you implement this right away. If you have a Kappa and you have a plan for it, they'll give you some credit for that and it won't be a major. 
but you really should have this all done by next week. So on that happy note, <laughs> now your job begins. I've given you sort of a, a 90 mile an hour view of what changed. So what I'm looking for you guys is what should I do for next week's webinar that I might not have already thought of? And what questions do you have uh, about this that I can answer? And please put them in the chat or the uh, q and I have a question. Sure. Why did my breakfast downstairs suck? <laughs> um, I was expecting like a full meal and they gave me a muffin and a Nutri-Grain bar. Well, just think what it's like when you're gluten-free like me and allergic to wheat. You can't mm. even have anything but the coffee. And the coffee is definitely not Starbucks. You can uh, take off your slide so they can see your full face. Yep. Um, I enjoyed the presentation and I have no intelligent question to ask you. And it sounds from the- The, the great, crickets in the background? The crickets in the background that, as I suspect that they came for you, Bobby, that you don't have Canadian questions. They don't have any? Michelle must have at least one client that's Canadian. Come on, Michelle. License. One. Put her, put her on. But she can put on what I forgot. I don't know how to make her a panelist from my phone. Make her a panelist? Let's see. Where's Michelle? Change all the panels. I did it. Yay. Now she just has to accept. Yes. There, we, there she is. Hey, Robert. Hi. That was great. Thank you. And you're that that one even snuck by me. So I'm, yeah, gonna... I'm, I'm I admit I it snuck by me. I knew about it. But I was like, Oh, that's no big deal. Because all the changes to Canadian regulations are no big deal. And then, I... then I had somebody ask like, so when are you gonna update your post market surveillance procedure? And that was my oh shit moment. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I emailed uh, one of my clients that's in Canada it, because uh, their notified body of the Metasep auditor kept pushing their audit back. And then they finally sent them an email that says, we have to do a, a one day remote audit this year so we can say we did it and then come on site in January. And so I'm like, emailing them like, oh shit, like we're, <laughs> are they coming next week? What's the plan? Like, yeah. let's. Well, I had I had a client that went through an audit the last two days, and it was like, so you sent the agenda, you started early by two hours. So last minute, I'm I'm in my car, and they're trying to do the opening meeting, and that was delightful. And I'm like, well, if there are any other changes to the schedule, please let me know. So I'm out to dinner last night. In ten minutes, <laughs> ten minutes before the check comes, I get this text. So are you logging in for the closing meeting? I'm like. What closing meeting? The audit finishes tomorrow. Oh, we we moved up the whole schedule. We did two 10-hour days to get the audit done a day early. I'm like, that's what I mean about letting me know of changes. That's a, that's a change. It constitutes a change order. Hey, a couple of things. Um, so uh, one of the things that amused me as you spoke was you said MD SAP was supposed to be a global thing and very few globals have bothered. So... I don't even know what to say to that. Like who, who thought that they could make this a global thing? That's more of a rhetorical question. Well, all the Duane... companies want global. So they have one on it and they don't, they satisfy all the countries in the world. Right. None of the countries agree with this approach mm -hmm. because they all want to have it done their way. Mm -hmm. So of right. the five countries that went in on this, it's Canada made it required and the FDA controls it all. And the other mm -hmm. three went along with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I think that the FDA joined Metasap just because they couldn't let like Canada be the boss of the harmonization effort. You know, I don't think that they really want this. I think that is a good part of it. I think another part of it is that they saw the opportunity to have people voluntarily submit reports mm -hmm. and they could use that as an excuse for not doing audits or inspections themselves. Mm -hmm. And right now in the situation where they're in, they're getting crucified by Congress for not keeping up on their inspections. 
so they, they've got this plan like, oh, we're going to do unannounced inspections of uh, China and India uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, because we're behind schedule. So we're going to send you some document requests and then we might show up on your doorstep with no notice. They've never done that before. Now, here's a fun fact I don't think a lot of people know is that what when you participate from the U.S. perspective with Metasap, you have to submit the full report to the FDA. Then the FDA audits the report and says, yes, they agree with the conclusion. But but that now they can see the results of your internal audits, your supplier audits, your management reviews, all these things that they can't see from a, during an FDA inspection. Now they have full visibility to because they're auditing your report. Yeah, they, they got around that exemption on the records. So mm -hmm. the Dwayne, great reason to join MDSAP. <laughs> Dwayne, you were first. Go ahead. Oh, I, I didn't have a question. I was just commenting. I found it useful. I just don't, I don't really have any, Yeah, you most said, of the questions, well, most of the questions I get from startups are, you know, why would they even go to Canada in the first place? Yeah. yeah. Pretty much like, you know, a lot of work and it's a very spread out country. And how am I even going to get, I mean, it just doesn't okay. seem great. Idea for yeah, Dwayne, I, I think that that's a, a great point for a couple of reasons. You know, you know Rob's already mentioned the reimbursement issues, um, but then uh, Metasap I was like, okay, that it's, certificate is so expensive. And if you only need it to go to Canada, mm -hmm. you know, that you really have to do a cost analysis there. And then third, these changes like Rob said, it's like it used to be that whatever changes Canada made didn't really affect your your processes that much. You just had to like change a couple of words or a title and or throw a slide in your management review and and it was fine. Well, this is very significant. This is like a change to your business practices if you're only in the U.S. and not doing MDR and whatnot. Yeah, which brings to Eddie's question, Eddie. Hello. Well, first of all, a, a brief update from the heart attack you gave me last week. My, <laughs> my notified body had their audit done like 18 months ago. So I think we are more to the right. I mean, I think we're at the sharp pointy end of the right hand side of the slide, Michelle. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, but my question is, because I, again, I hadn't you know, had never really thought about Canada because I've got that imperialist American attitude, even though I've lived over here for a long time in Europe. So I just presumed that Canada would just, we just slide that right in there when we go to the U.S. in a couple of years time, blah, blah, blah. But my question is, how, how much does it make it easier since we're starting off with MDR in the EU? Is it, is there, you know, an easier pathway into Canada? So we might think about Canada even before the U.S.? Um, I would say the U.S. is the easiest market because they don't require ISO certification. Yeah. And you do have the 510K process, but the 510K process is not all that different from the Canadian licensing process for class two and three and four. Okay. And the European process is 10 times worse. So mm -hmm. if I had my, if I were running my own company, I would say, I'm going to go to U.S. first, and then I'm going to go to Canada because it's so similar, except for the ISO certification, and then I'm going to think about other countries. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. But for people that say, well, why would I go to Canada? That, that's a valid question. But the answer is actually uh, twofold. Number one is uh, technical. The, the client that I was talking about that had their closing audit meeting last night, they've been audited three times this year. And this was the fourth audit. And the reason why is because they de decided they weren't going to get MDSAP. I said, you're going to regret that because I've seen your plan for the countries you want to go to. You're going to get audited by Anvisa. You're going to get audited because they went to Brazil. You're going to get audited by the, or inspected by the FDA. You're going to get audited by Australia. You're going to get audited by Japan. And then you're going to go to Canada. I was like, get the MDSAP now. He's like, no, it's too much work. It costs too much money. So now, wow. now he's buried in just dealing with Kappas from audits. And he spent more money in consulting than he would have spent on MD SAP certification. 
<laughs> Rob, what a what a what a shift in where innovation happens now and where people go to first. In in 27, 2017 or 2018, we wrote a commercialization plan for a company out of Brazil of where they should go and, and what markets they should attack and which ones we go first. Uh, no, this was at NAMSA. And it was, uh, I think US was like third on the list. It was Europe. And then we were going to go to Canada. And then it was US, China, Japan, all relatively around the same time. But regardless, now... If you're a European company, unless you're beholden to some type of grant where you have to go to your local market first, mm-hmm. like if, if you if you don't if you're not beholden to any of that, you're going to the U.S. first, and yeah. then maybe Europe and Canada, and probably if you're a startup, you probably don't even go to it. You probably end up exiting your company before that. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy the shift in three years, two years yeah. that we've seen. And and I would say that. Um, that's why we continue to see an increase in our business of more international customers. I'm actually seeing the num as a percentage of our business, we're seeing the number of U.S. customers decline and the number of international clients increase. And I know that's I'm not imagining it is because I'm having more calls before 6 a.m. and more calls after 8 p.m. than I ever had before. And so are all my staff. And well, the word got like, out. Are you crazy? Yep. The word got out that you never sleep and you're available 24 seven. That's why. Yeah, but it did. It, it got out in Korea. <laughs> really? I think there's what, just not that many people doing it. How much uh, year over year? What's what's the growth at your company? Um, we had a big growth last in the last 12 months, I think normal growth for us is going to be 20%, but I'm trying to manage that. I've, you know, the COVID expansion for us was, uh, it was a good strategic move for me, but it was not a great move health-wise or personally. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I definitely have more gray hairs. I look at pictures from a year ago. I'm like, yep, that's COVID related. <laughs> because of regulation or when you it say help, oh, I added on. I added on two new full-time employees. Mm-hmm. I had just before that I had already added on one. So I really, in twelve months, I added on three people, and we added on uh, probably another twenty customers. How about you, Michelle? I know you're growing leaps and bounds too. What's your year over year, if you don't mind sharing? Um, the I've experienced the COVID flux too, and it's been it was fifty to seventy-five percent the past couple of years, but I think uh, it's going to settle into 20 to 30 yeah. percent. Um, but but I agree with Rob, you know, between as fast as the FDA changed the regulations or the, the terms of the EUA products and uh, the types of people that were trying to get into COVID, it just made me, it made me crazy for about a year and a half. You know, you'd have people that made mattresses that all of a sudden want to make surgical gowns and you know, they're like design controls, what? Do you have a sense, you know, you guys are my go-tos for regulatory and quality stuff. And uh, I talk about you guys all the time um, and you have great social profiles. That aside, do you have a sense of how the industry of regulatory and quality consultants are doing year over year? Like, are you winning share at the expense of other people or is the demand across the board higher? Do you have a sense? I think the demand across the board is higher. And if you look at um, consulting firms that are just a little bit larger than us, um, they're exiting for stupid, stupid (laughs) amounts of money. Like, it's it's all it's it's borderline like it's not the multiples that some of the tech companies are going for, but it makes no it makes that little sense for and, and I'm I'm sure Rod knows Rob knows who I'm talking about or some I, of the people I'm talking about. I've had about. five offers to buy the company in the last few months. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and, I'm not even talking to you, I'm not interested. <laughs> you did not return my calls though. So as I can I could probably comment a little on this because. I've worked for two of the companies that are acquiring <laughs> most of most of these kind of groups. Uh, you know, I think the so that so so LabCorp just acquired Toxicon, uh, which is a big preclinical service, right? So it's not regulatory and quality, but 
2018, they acquired RCRI up in Minneapolis. Um, and so NAMSA has also been a big, since they were acquired by a private equity firm, they've been a large acquirer of other consulting groups, other small CROs, uh, APS up in Minneapolis, you know, bigger ones like that as well. But um, there, there is this consolidation of these large CROs who are, their bread and butter is clinical, coming in and acquiring regulatory reimbursement consultants, quality consultants, uh, clinical strategy consultants to build them into their team so that the perception for companies is they have these end-to-end -end services for you, right? And, and, and in theory, it makes a lot of sense. The biggest question is, and I'm glad, Rob, you are saying no, <laughs> Michelle is saying no, is can these large organizations actually implement what they are telling customers? Um, my opinion is 100% no, um, being involved in these. So, so um, it makes sense in theory, right? But that is, so that is their idea behind all of this. I don't know if it is practical to say that they could deliver the same value Michelle or Rob would deliver to a client, a part of a large organization. That is my two cents there. I just The clients I, I get that are coming from somebody, some of these big consulting firms, they're like, they, they, they didn't help me at all. Like they, they told me what to do, but they didn't tell me how to do it. They wouldn't do it for me. I didn't understand what they said. And so it's like impractical and not implementable if you are a small to mid-sized company. Because they can't, because right. legally they, you know, they're part of now, now these consulting firm, you know, the, or these larger organizations, their bread and butter wasn't consulting. It was executing a clinical trial. So, so legally there are so many parameters around what they can actually consult on and what they can do for you. So that strategic piece while they might advertise they have it, they can't actually do it. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that is fundamentally changing in our business, and I'd be interested to know if Michelle's seeing the same thing, it's forcing us to implement automation tools and software to make the job manageable. Yeah. It's yeah. without software, we can't keep up with the with the big boys. So we have to implement some software tools to just make it repeatable and consistent and fast. Are these tools you're building or um, SAAS kind of? Yes. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is, I think, our 108th episode. Thank you, everyone. And um, this is our last broadcast for 2021. I've invited every uh, premium member on this call to become a panelist right now. Uh, two have declined. I guess they're indisposed or something. Um, I wanted to say thank you. And, um, uh, you know, one of the reasons I think that so many people show up every week is because we built a little family here. I really hope, and this may sound self-serving, um, that you all come to 10X. I mean, if you want to meet Rob and Michelle and Dwayne and everyone in person, this is where we're going to do it. Um, myself, personally, I miss, I miss the hugs. Uh, I get ice cream all the time. In fact, I had ice cream for breakfast before the breakfast opened. It was melting. We put it outside, but it still was kind of a little mushy. Um, and uh, it's, to borrow a Christmas song, it's one of the most wonderful times <laughs> of the year. My voice isn't warmed up, so I didn't really hit that last note. Um, Dwayne, you have a change coming in 2022. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, uh, I will be jumping into uh, Project MedTech full time. So I'll be leading the uh, network side of the company and also our, we'll be launching our consulting practice as well. Um, so there, for those who don't know. What's that? Where are you now and where, where are you leaving? Yeah, I'm at LabCorp uh, on their medical device and diagnostic team. Uh, and I'll be leaving that to uh, jump into what was just a podcast <laughs> for when I launched it, right? And it's, it's, thing, or did they give you notice? 
I've given my notice. They, they, they know before uh, Thanksgiving actually. Okay. Yep. So uh, I will be doing that and we'll be expanding our, our, our offerings on the network side and also launching our consulting practice where we're focused on startup companies and really helping them build successful med tech companies um, almost from an internal business development role. And then uh, I'll actually be doing some work with Michelle as well. Maybe me too. We need to talk. Anyone else that I promoted to panelists? Uh, I can't see everyone the way I can when I'm on my computer. Uh, Andre, Jorg, Luke, anyone you want to tell us about your 2022 and how this network can help you? Well, this is Jorg. Um, I, uh, well, I'm excited, of course, to go to 10X and see everybody in person. But uh, in general, it was great seeing you last week in uh, Biomed Device and Dwayne as well. Yeah, so we have I'm, uh, a meet in person if you guys want to see the three of us together. <laughs> yeah, so that was a lot of fun. But you know, I'm hoping to uh, to get back to more normal. We've had a lot of growth this year, over 100% growth. Um, Who is we? So, we have two companies. Uh, Tech, TechFlex Development. Um, Not about that. Tell them what you do. Sorry. <laughs> Always the marketer. Um, TechFlex Development, we're doing uh, medical device uh, design and development, both software and hardware. Um, offshore, we're doing it in Ukraine. Um, and that business has just just soared over. I don't know whether it's because of COVID or what it is, but uh, we are we are growing fast and uh, trying to to manage that, of course. So, as your marketer, I learned a thing or two when you had me interview some folks for testimonials, and what they said was, "You and your colleague Anna um, are stateside, so it's very easy to work um, leveraging." Ukrainian talent. They're very well educated. There are lower cost points. So you're able to compete, not that you compete on price, um, but able to do that effectively. And they're very well prepared. Uh, they show up every week with an update and it makes it really easy for folks to just like, I know they got it. I can call Jorg if I need it and just take care of software development in particular. I was impressed with what they had to say about you. So I tip my hat. Um, Andre, what, is there anything? Uh, no, just um, as everybody probably figures out that I'm, I'm glad to be part of this group. Uh, because of COVID, we, our contract uh, electronic manufacturing of medical devices went down considerably because we manufacture a number of products using plastic surgery. So I don't have to tell you what happened to that during the past 12 months or so. Huh, I didn't months. big market for you. I think yeah. you were going to plastic and that a lot of it was produced in Wuhan and that no. you said any product. <laughs> No, we have, a, we have a therapeutic device that's used post-surgically in plastic surgery uh, that's pretty widely used. And, and unfortunately, that business kind of went away. <clears throat> but our engineering design services have picked up and we have been referred to a number of other contract electronic manufacturing devices. So 2022 looks like it's definitely going to be better than the past year. <clears throat> How about you? What have you got to tell us about next year? I'm excited for next year. I think it's going to be same year as the past year and a half with uh, growth, uh, fortunately, but it, we're also trying to solve some uh, operational, um, not issues now, but just uh, preparing to operate that growth. That's something important. Um, we're also um, looking into post-market surveillance. We're hiring um, uh folks for our post-market surveillance unit, also trying to get more national clients in Mexico. Um, Just back a little for those who don't know precisely what your company does, if you tell It's them. a regulatory affairs consulting firm, um, helping companies access the Mexican market. And is it um, Mexico or can we think beyond Mexico to Central America or South or just Mexico, which is big enough, of course. Solo Mexico, only so Mexico, me solo Mexico. Okay. Uh, but uh, we also partner with uh, consulting firms in Latin America that we can refer you with. Okay. Yeah. Jose's, but, uh, group, uh, Jose's group just partnered with Greenlight. Yeah. Oh, tell me so that. Speaking, speaking to uh, our, our discussion about software tools. Exactly. Yeah, we're trying to bring uh, Greenlight to Mexico, uh, to the growing medical device industry in Mexico. 
So we're trying to get them introduced first to quality management system, paper-based. A lot of them, they don't have it, <laughs> but also uh, jumping into the EQMS. Talk so to uh, Nelly as well. She's not on today's call, but if you missed it some weeks back and I can find it for you, she gave what was a pretty compelling argument for paper-based QMS. And I was like, paper, how antiquated. Excel, what are you talking about? I didn't think that was a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. So, so not, not sat in on that presentation. You might want to yeah. get in touch. Yeah, no. So next year, I mean, we have to have a, uh, we have to uh, approach uh, medical device manufacturers in Mexico so they can uh, get introduced to quality management systems, definitely. And uh, as to leveraging with the group that we have every Friday, uh, a lot of these folks are trying to get to other markets like the United States. So it's definitely uh, something that I will be knocking on your doors uh, to help with that. Okay. How about you, Tugwell? What have you got to tell us about next year? And by the way, let me quickly add, I've been kind of lenient with the premium folks. I did take pricing. That is, I, I'm not, the discounts to 10X are decreasing as I get closer to the event. Let me say that by the 31st of the month, I'm going to stick with what I have on the website. So if anybody is on this call and they are thinking about coming, please let me know today, tomorrow, whatever, um, so I can give you the preferred pricing. Uh, I really hope as many of you can come as, as possible. John? Yeah, it's been an interesting year. I, I sort of made a decision in my head to get out of the regulatory side and concentrate more on the quality or higher level side of medical devices. Typically, I just tell people to go to Rob or Michelle uh, <laughs> when it gets to the deeper regulatory stuff anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Our business used to be about 90% EU. Uh, it's now shifted to partly because I prefer it that way to 90% plus to FDA. So mostly working with companies that are either EU moving over here or uh, like in Australia or whatever else on the FDA related issues. Uh, also, in, I'm in aerospace too. So that's becoming more and more of an issue with some of the uh, things like Blue Origin and Virgin Galactica and uh, <laughs> things like that. So you can launch us into space if we need someone as a connection, that's you. Yep, if you want to. <laughs> I'm not volunteering to go and just work with them. <laughs> Your year in 2022, then 21, what have you got planned? Sorry? Jan. No, I'm looking for Jan if she'll yeah. come on. I have her as. Who are you I, talking to? I'm talking to Jan Gates. Is she there? Oh, oh, I'm here. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for 2022, I there's a lot more uh, people finally understanding that packaging is part of the product and it needs to be done. It's, it's um, especially with sustainability coming in, people are thinking about alternatives to what they used to do, but they still seem to think they can all do their own packaging many times. And when I come in after, especially after an FDA observation and see that they have tried to do packaging without actually pulling the pieces together that need to be done from the quality systems and regulatory affairs aspect, it's been quite interesting. So I am part of a group now. We have a co-op group. We went from two people to six people this year. The biggest issue I'm seeing uh, that's pulling away people that are good in medical devices is cannabis. They are just gobbling up packaging engineers and paying them exorbitant money to, to get their packaging stuff out there, even more than what COVID has done. You're, you're saying that they're getting high salaries? Oh, well, they're, they're paying the consultants a lot more. Yes, very that was, much higher. That, that, was, that was a, yeah. It's Luke, been, you tried to talk before, but you were on mute. You want to give it another go? Yeah, I, I still had a question on Canada on the on the, the topic. But that was like a half hour ago. Yeah, I know, but it's so fun with you. Go on. Um, is uh, is there any change in labeling? I mean, if you look at uh, clause twenty one one dash B, I guess it says you need to have an address 
of the manufacturer on the label. Boring. No, it's not boring because if you have a long street name or you live in that, that silly old uh, village in Wales, you have troubles in getting that onto the label. And if, if, in the Netherlands, Get a new if street you, name. We did. We, we, we had to use the address of, an, uh, of a subsidiary to get it onto the label, which, was, which, which is crazy. Because if you send a check to 7546MS-28, uh, it will land on my doormat. It's uniquely in the Netherlands, but it was not allowed. So is there any change in labeling according to the new MDR? The, Question for Rob. The regulation wasn't specific to labeling. It was specific to um, incident reporting and post-market surveillance. Um, but Canada has always maintained that you have to have a physical address for your label. That's always been the case. And they, if for Canadian companies, they actually spot check go to the location to see if you have uh, a mailbox, mailboxes, et cetera, uh, box there, or whether it's a real facility. And um, companies that don't have a real physical address, they send you letters. And if you don't uh, fix the problem, then they, um, then they remove your license and you can no longer sell in Canada. So they, that's always been a requirement of yep. Canada. Oh, so you, you, you never heard of any other companies that have problems with that, with labeling and long names? Well, Luke, if, if you're not familiar, there's a there's a global app called What Three Words. Yeah, I know those. <laughs> yeah. Is that allowed? What is it? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to look it up because uh, yeah, just, just, just Google Google What Three Words, and basically. The, the, somebody, some person has divided the entire planet into like three meter squares. Okay. So your house will have like 15 different specific, highly specific addresses. And arguably, if you want DHL to deliver a package to your side window, you can tell them with a what three word address, what part of your building you want something to be ended up. It's crazy. Um, other applications are like if you're yeah. if you if, if you broke your leg in a field, you can tell the paramedics exactly where you are. With the with I just the, just the, know I'm living at Clipped Private Bliss. <laughs> That's a great one. That's wonderful. What what did you? I spoke over you, Luke. What did you say? I'm I'm living at Clipped.Private.Bliss, and that's a, a maybe a ten yard square. On the, on the planet Earth. Yeah. So you can okay. identify any piece on Earth with just three words. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that would require much, much, much broader knowledge of this database for it to be practical. So oh, if there are a so lot of other labeling things that have to be done too that didn't used to be there that's made it very difficult to put labels onto medical devices, especially mm -hmm. sterile ones. Yeah. It's pain there's there's a new symbols guidance that came out this year or revised symbol guidance that came out this year there's a revised standard for information provided by the manufacturer so both of those are definitely applicable to all your labeling and have i seen a single company buy those standards and update all their labeling to it no <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess they're just waiting for the nonconformity, and I'm waiting for the check for the for the kappa. Yeah, all, all the bigger companies I know of, we've had to do a lot of work with the packaging just to get the freaking labels on and the IFUs in in the boxes. So, so if you just think about all the configurations of CE marks that you have to put on now, you've got your CE mark for the EU, CE UK, C. Then, then depending on the configurations of CE that you have, you have to might have to have a CENI for Northern Ireland. Who knows what Switzerland and Turkey might require if they all exit? So it's just getting it's just getting chaotic. And and then my customers are freaking out. They're like, "What do we have to do? Like have a whole separate European inventory, European labeled?" And I'm like, "Probably because it logistically can't all fit." Uh, yeah, or, or that you're in a packaging went, this big. Pharmaceuticals went nuts because they have different requirements in the U.S. and and Europe than 
it, and you can't have the same inventory because you, it's against the law to do some of the things in Europe you have to do in the FDA and the other way around too. So, God, let, it's- Let me draw team's attention to Mr. Kevin Pullman. Um, tell us what you're looking at for 2022. Oh, I wish I knew, Joe. <laughs> I, I had sent you that message a while ago where, where we thought we, we were sold. Um, I may be pulling the plug on that deal. And when I get back in January, we're not thrilled with the, uh, the people so far. Remind so, the folks. Too. Yeah, so, so we've got an uh, antimicrobial polymer technology that can go into a lot of different stuff, including PPE and medical devices. Uh, we can Absolutely. kind of work, work those polyolefins a lot of different ways. Is yours a, a viable company on its own or are you going to run out of cash? What's the situation if you don't have the merger go through or whatever? Um, we got to go back to uh, fundraising. Um, the medical side is actually the, the easier and cheaper uh, side for us. And that's not really a burden if we got to go that ourselves. The, the big struggle for us is actually for the non-device applications where we need a, uh, an EPA registration. Uh, the EPA side of it is a heck of a lot more expensive to get done, quite frankly. So, you know, so, so we'll see. But uh, uh, I'm kind of uh, spending my holiday week going back through the business plan and uh, putting, mm. putting the plan back together if, uh, if we got to start undertaking stuff ourselves again uh, come the second week of January. My advice, eggnog, lots of eggnog. Yep. And uh, I, I, had, uh, I had sent Rob an email yesterday. I need a, uh, I got a quick question for you, Rob. And uh, I also have an offer uh, to buy you lunch. At some point in the next uh, three or four weeks, I'm going to be in Brattleboro to shop for wood flooring. So I may drop in on you. Okay. I, I'm up in the Rutland area, but it's Less than an hour over to. Oh, I, I I don't know why I thought you were over towards Brattleboro. I I, I, I would have. I, I used would... to be. Oh, um, okay. Now I'm up in the Rutland area, but um, I I saw your email and I just haven't had a chance to respond, so I will respond later on today. There you go. Yeah, Merry I, Christmas. I, I... Goodbye, everybody. Merry I gotta Christmas. hit another meeting. <laughs> yep. And, well, and, and actually, uh, I do have an ask. If anybody has uh, anybody they can recommend on the industrial design side. Um, go on. We, we, that's, that's kind of part of our project, uh, and it's related to a grant application I may undertake in, in January for a, uh, 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 respirator design. Maybe Rick Stockton can help you. I don't know. Reach out. Okay. There's a, there's a company in Minneapolis I've worked with a couple of times called Kablooey. Oh yeah. Tom um, Kramer. Um, there's also another firm that I just worked on with another client. I just can't remember the name. Yeah. What I, I mean to say, it's not a rush, but if you, if it occurs to you, just shoot me an email with, with, uh, their contact. Sure. Let me wrap Appreciate up. It. Say, uh, thanks for a good year, folks. Um, let me know how we can continue to, uh, bring you value in 2022. Uh, if the model needs to change or we need, um, you know, different speakers or someone to you know, topics of interest. Um, I'm more than happy to take your input. Um, and then I guess for Joe Hage and Joe Hage Enterprises, happy holidays, a happy new year. And uh, our next broadcast will be, what is that? January 7th or so. I'll see you then. See you on okay. Slack. Have a good Thanks, holiday. Joe. Have a good Thanks. holiday, everybody. Bye-bye.